Additional opening statement is again to uh, thank our, our partners. Definitely want to thank the state of Texas, uh, represented by Chairman Bonin and uh, Texas A&M, represented by Chancellor Sharp and President Welch. Thank you. All right. With that, any uh, who's got the first question? Uh, if you could, could you explain what this facility is uh, from a nuts and bolts perspective? And, and please step up to the microphone. Yeah, if you, you don't mind. mind. Thank you so much. Whoever's speaking. Okay. Well, so maybe I'll just set a little bit of context. Is that uh, we have um, about 240 acres of land uh, that we're going to uh, make available, and we've already signed uh, today an agreement with Texas A&M. They will have about uh, over 30 acres that they will be developing a facility on. It's a part of a broader uh, area we're calling Exploration Park. And we're making all of that land available. It will be outside of our access controlled area so that uh, you will not have to go through all of the security steps, et cetera, that you do when you go to a government facility. And this will allow us to have a space where we can have collaboration between academia, industry, and we expect our international community as well. That's the broader picture and context of what Exploration Park will be. And we're expecting many companies, as Dr. Bonin said, that will also join us. Uh, but it's going to be anchored by the Texas A&M Space Institute. And I'll turn it over to you to talk about Space Institute. Well, the reason this is a game changer for us, and I, and I believe for NASA, is because every other facility in the country has to do with orbiting. This is going to be the one that has to do uh, with the surface of the moon and the surface of Mars. If you're going to colonize the moon, if you're going to colonize Mars, you better be able to test your equipment and your robots, et cetera, before you get 200 and something thousand miles away or, or, or further. And so what this is going to allow us to do with the, with the footprint of uh, two and a half acres apiece uh, is allow NASA and the private sector, there will be bays in this that allow everyone to enter from different places to test their equipment, and it will be the only place in the world uh, that's like this, the only place that's climate controlled. Uh, with a footprint of two and a half acres, as I said, that's about the footprint of, of Kyle Field, or, or most college stadiums. And so it's a very large facility. Uh, it's going to be one of a kind in the world, and it will be the place that everybody in the nation comes to test their, test their facilities uh, on a replica of the moon surface and the Mars surface. Um, please, Houston Houston Business. Business. Uh, please state your name and affiliation. Sorry. Sure. Uh, I'm Jishni Nair with Houston Business Journal. Uh, thank you everyone for being here and announcing this. Uh, for Director Johnson, could you like shed a little bit more light on what we could expect to see from Exploration Park? Like, uh, what is the vision for that district and that use of land besides um, yes, uh, so, uh, and I also just want to state that the um, facility that's being developed by Texas A&M is going to be a game changer. Uh, right now, today, uh, we have uh, facilities at Johnson where we train our astronauts, we do testing and operations. However, the magnitude, the size of this facility, and it's going to be state of the art, um, it will have the ability for us to do things that we've not been able to do currently. We will be doing human and robotic training together. When we go to the moon this time, we're going to go sustainably. So we need to have habitats. We need to have an area large enough for us to be able to lay out and test on the ground, as Chancellor Sharp said, before going into space. Uh, in addition to that area, we're also making available and we have um, plans for a private developer to come in and to develop uh, spaces for other companies. So the way that NASA has been uh, doing business today is, is different than it was in the past. Uh, right now, we have government programs, we also have commercial programs, and then there are also private investors, people that are entrepreneurs. So we're laying out a space architecture that allows for us to have all of those communities intertwine and working together in space. But guess what? We should do that here on Earth before we go there. So this will be a place for us to have uh, all of those companies, entrepreneurs, uh, we, we envision an innovation district, all of that being available uh, here. 
And, uh, but again, as I said, it's great to have an anchor tenant and to already have someone that is gonna have plans to get us started in down road. Director Weiss, if I may, uh, Paul Cater Deaton with I-45 now and today, KHOU. Um, my daddy always said, measure twice, cut once. This gives you all a, a, a wonderful opportunity to do that. Where do we stand now with, with respect to a timeline and what will you discover tomorrow? So the timeline for the Artemis program, guess what? It started because a part of Artemis is doing robotic missions and the launch uh, yesterday, last night, this morning, of Intuitive Machines, uh, their commercial lander is, is a part of the exploration that we're planning to do. So with that, that's the beginnings, and we've been working uh, to have our astronauts get uh, to the surface of the moon. But first, we're gonna do like we did Apollo. We're gonna do an orbital mission, and so we named uh, last year our Artemis II crew, they will go and they will be doing uh, a, a lunar orbital mission coming up uh, by September of 2025. And then by September of 2026, our plans are with SpaceX, uh, another company that is located here in Texas. Uh, they're building that landing system down in Boca Chica, but we will be doing training for that system and we're working and they want to do that uh, somewhere in this area, they will be doing it. And so Exploration Park would be a great place for them to be able to, to support that. So that will be another step. Towards us then, going forward, we have plans over the decade and going into the 30s of having a sustainable um, lunar um, facility on the moon itself and we will have uh, rovers, we will have uh, the ability for those ro rovers to do science while our humans are not there. They will actually uh, be able to um, provide uh, systems that we will then get the data back and uh, be able to operate from, from ground uh, to, the, to the lunar surface. But our plans are for us to, to build out that capability over the next decade. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, got a couple questions. I'm not sure who's the best to answer this, but now that the ground lease is signed, what, is, what are the next steps in the timeline for A&M's facility to get open over the next few years? Mm -hmm. Bob Ambrose is here. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, <clears throat> oh, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Robert Ambrose. I'm a professor at Texas A&M, formerly uh, uh, at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, we've gone through <clears throat> the, uh, the development of a conceptual design. We hired a firm and that, that phase is now completed. Uh, we uh, brought that to the Texas A&M Board of Regents last Friday and uh, they approved that and going forward with the ground lease that we're, we're signing today. Uh, the next major step will be uh, bringing in a, a contractor team to build the facility and uh, a and is pretty good at building buildings. If you look around the state, we've got uh, new buildings going up in Fort Worth and down in the valley and down in the medical center and that process I, I'm new to because you know I'm, I'm only a couple of years at A&M but I'm very impressed by the construction team that we've got so we're working on a, on a, a tight schedule uh, you heard uh, 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 director Weish's schedule for when we're going to need the facility so we want to try and meet some of those mild, uh, milestones and uh, get the facility in, in time for that first human landing uh, to be able to uh, help with her training needs. And then all of the training needs that follow that. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at construction over the next uh, two to three years uh, to have a big uh, uh, opening day. Uh, between now and then, will be a number of milestones. Uh, we're gonna be putting things out uh, uh, for bid. We'll have a groundbreaking ceremony. And I, I think uh, if you stay tuned, you're, you're gonna hear some other opportunities to kind of celebrate this, this progress as we, we go forward. But we're also not waiting. Uh, as uh, uh, Chancellor Sharp mentioned, the facility is going to have some bays inside. Uh, on the ground floor, we call those garages because they have uh, roll-up doors. Imagine a garage where you open the roll-up door and you roll out on the moon. Uh, so our, our goal is to have those uh, set aside for all the different companies and groups that want to use them. So we're working that right now. Uh, we held a workshop where we had 150 companies come talk to us about how do you put money down on a garage, and how do you, you, you know, do you want one on the moon side or the Mars side? 
Uh, so we're going to be working those kind of details, making sure that we have that mix of academia and, and government and industry all working together in the facility. Yeah, and while you're while you're up here, Dr. Ambrose, can you kind of share the details you know now of how these test beds are actually going to work once they're up and operational? Yeah, so uh, back in the day I, when I used to work uh, for Director Weiss at JSC, I uh, I ran the JSC Rock Yard, and you know one of my goals uh, was to someday put it out of business because it was rough, you know, especially in August, <laughs> really rough. Um, and what we really, and besides it being hard on the people. Um, we really needed a place where we could turn the lights out. So if you mm -hmm. think of the south pole of the moon, it's not gonna look like some of the Apollo images are really well lit. The sun's gonna be down at a very low angle. If you've ever tried driving west into the sun in the evening, that's what the astronauts are gonna face. So we need to try that out first here at an on-the-ground facility and not have them discover that, oh, I need a visor, you know, or other things to help them in that, that harsh lighting. Uh, so we're going to be able to absolutely turn the lights out on the moon side. And then we'll have a, a lamp set up that's just blindingly bright that we will we'll position and come up with different tactics to help the astronauts drive. And even the robot driving is going to be tough. Uh, so, you know, those are the kind of challenges and we really need a large place where we could just turn the lights out. You know, it's, uh, even an outdoor rock yard, you know, in Houston, in most places around the country, it's never dark, you know, with the, the light sky, right? So we'll be able to go to absolutely pitch black, control the lighting, um, and uh, it, it also won't be quite as difficult working in August as, as it was. <laughs> so we're, we're, the, the people are looking forward to that. Yeah. Answer your question? Yes. Okay, okay. next question. Yeah, for for the, the president, the chancellor, and, and probably the representative here, Texas A&M has the, the distinguished space grant, right? So how important was it to, to make sure that it was Texas A&M that was partnering with NASA, given the history that the two institutions have with each other? Sure. Uh, so that was a, a decision that was very carefully uh, weighed and measured for this specific project. And first of all, it was important for the state to have a way that we could partner and make a capital investment with the Johnson Space Center, a federal agency, and yet have that investment through an entity of the state and be responsible to the taxpayers of the state of Texas through their elected representatives. So A&M was certainly under consideration for that, but when you look more closely, uh, what you see is that they have uh, just incredibly robust uh, infrastructure already in place as it pertains to the expertise that's needed to be a part of this. Uh, Dr. Nancy curry Gregg, uh, who was here yesterday, Dr. Ambrose, who you just heard from, uh, I think combined they have over 50 years of experience uh, working for NASA and specifically uh, here at the Johnson Space Center. There, there are very few places, maybe not any place, that you can go and find that type of experience and professionalism and intellectual uh, you know, knowledge. So you combine that with the working relationship that already exists through uh, Space Alliance Technology Outreach Program that a and is also running. There's a high school aerospace scholars program that is currently a, a partnership with the Johnson Space Center and Texas A&M through the Bay Area Houston Economic Partnership. And there's just a myriad of ways in which this relationship was already uh, established and they were the very natural partner and natural fit for this specific initiative. Dr. Dr. Bonin, maybe you can speak to this. Um, you guys mentioned the Space Commission that you guys are looking to name. Where are you guys at in the timeline of that and when you hope to have that group of people? I, I hope to name that group uh, a few months ago. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I think you can expect uh, that the governor's office, along with the lieutenant governor, governor's office and the speaker's office, will make an announcement in the very, very near future. That is uh, essentially completed. Uh, so the, the finishing touches are being placed on that, and that group will be able to get to work uh, very, you know, very quickly. Um, I would also add that a lot of the background work for the commission has actually been underway. Uh, there are some foundational elements that uh, we're able to, to work through the governor's office to get those things done so that when the commission's actually appointed, they can hit the ground running. Mm. Uh, so we're actually already uh, working on that. And can you kind of just give a quick overview of what exactly the, the, the role of those people will be? Yeah, so there's a commission, there's a consortium, and there's also a fund through which the state will make additional 
capital investments. The, the consortium is a consortium of all of higher education in the state. There's a governance structure uh, and there are ex-officio members, which would include the University of Texas system, Texas A&M, and Rice. Mm. And then uh, the other positions would be populated by other representatives of institutions of, of higher education in the state. The actual uh, commission, uh, the vision that we have for that is that it will be uh, represented by people who come from a military space background, civilian space, such as uh, NASA, the private sector, and higher education. And these will be people that have experience and knowledge that will be unparalleled in the world, uh, frankly. And their, their task will be to come up with a strategic plan for the state of Texas, and then to help us have a focus and an action plan for how we advance space development and exploration through this commission and through the state of Texas. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bond, um, just to kind of follow up and get like some insight from the legislative process, during sort of the assembly of the, of the bill that led to you know, the creation of the space fund and uh, sort of the place and steps for this facility, um, how much of a vision did you kind of have for uh, you know what this was going to come to or uh, what vision it had? And um, secondly, I wanted to ask, you know, how would you answer questions about whether this is the best use of state funds for advancing Texas as a space economy? So part of the purpose of the commission is specifically to vet those questions because there will be a lot of opportunities and we want to leverage our capital. We want to see that translate into private dollars that are invested and federal dollars that are invested here in Texas as opposed to in other locations. In fact, that was one of the things that we recognized is other states, uh, which are friendly competitors, we're all on the same team, uh, but Florida has Space Florida. Alabama has the Huntsville Space Authority. And there are other states that have been very focused, very intentional, and very strategic in the investments that they're making, not only from a, a financial standpoint, but making sure uh, that from a, a regulatory and, and other standpoint, which we pride ourselves on in Texas, is being very business friendly and wanting to have a fair but light regulatory environment. But they have been focused specifically on the space sector. And I think in Texas, we've just uh, taken for granted the fact that because we have this rich legacy uh, and we have tremendous natural resources and tremendous human resources will always uh, be the leader, uh, but yet we haven't been as strategic or as intentional about it. And so that's the whole point of this initiative is to say, yeah, we have tremendous resources. Yes, we are a world leader in this field, but we can do better and we can be more focused and more efficient. And then through the process of doing that, we vet the opportunities and make sure that there is a return on investment for the taxpayer. That was part of the reason why the capital for this specific project went through Texas A&M. It's a state agency, they're accountable to the legislature, they're accountable to the governor, and that accountability is, is what we want when we make an investment. Uh, next, one, next one I have is for uh, Director Johnson, um, kind of going back to the theme of you know uh, private space companies here in Houston and kind of uh, commercial growth here in Houston. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask is, you know, how can private companies at sort of any stage of their lifespan uh, engage with this facility um, beyond sort of what was kind of already outlined? Yeah, no, and I'm glad to, um, to uh, be able to elaborate about that because today we engage with our um, private uh, industry entrepreneurs, uh, large, big, small companies through various means. And we will continue to do that. Um, what we will be able to do is I believe this will help to facilitate them doing that. Again, as I mentioned, it will be outside of our controlled access area and they would have more, I would say, more free um, ability to come and go and to uh, function. One of the other good things about this is, is that across the state of Texas, we will be able to uh, engage uh, through virtual means as well. So it won't just be about you know, engaging here in the Houston area, but we can also then do outreach to rural communities. Uh, and uh, Texas A&M, having the Texas A&M system, where they already have campuses all over the state, is a natural partner for us to be able to do that. Thank you. Do you know, go, go if you, oh, sorry. Uh, if you don't mind, sir, you had mentioned earlier um, about the need for more Aggies in space, I believe. And notably, there's Mike Fossum, there are others. Uh, where are the next ones going to come from with respect to curriculum that's coming online for this specific project? 
Yeah, you'd have to talk to Dr. Ambrose about the specific curriculum, but <clears throat> I'll tell you this, a, a Texas A&M produces great citizens, not just great Aggies. Uh, and they're all, they believe in this country, they believe in the state, they believe in big dynamic ideas. All of that fits this project. Um, and so I am unbelievably excited about having great people who are part of great organizations working on a great idea supported by a great state. Um, I, you, we are gonna generate interest in the entire space enterprise with this project among the student body at Texas A&M, and there's a bunch of them. And they're in all different fields. They're gonna be required not just to get to the moon and to Mars, but to stay there, as the director mentioned, and to sustain operations there over time. And it's gonna require science in so many different fields new technology de development, so many different areas, and individual skills that are just different than the combinations we've used in the past. Uh, those people all exist on the university that I'm privileged to be part of. And so we're really excited about this. And one of the things I've gotten excited about this morning, actually, is the chancellor's reference to the footprint of Kyle Field and the renewal of the rivalry with Texas this fall has got me thinking, how many of those other great rivalries have ever been played on Mars? <laughs> we have a special opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You want some specifics from Dr. Ambrose? Yes, please, if you okay. don't mind, sir. All right, well, I can't follow that one. But um, uh, So you, you talked about curriculum, and uh, think young and old, okay? So what we really need with such a, 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 a dynamic uh, com uh, industry right now is not just all the new uh, great talent coming out of A&M, which is enormous. You know how huge A&M is. We're just pouring people into the region, well-educated, great citizens. But then think about, a uh, specifically for this facility, think about workforce training. So I've already talked to multiple companies that are in the area about having kind of boot camps. So as they're bringing in people from all over the country, imagine if we could have boot camps in this facility for very specific training. So they've already you know, come out of college, maybe they've even worked in another industry for 10 or 20 years. We can have very specific boot camps that get them spun up to work in specific parts of the Johnson Space Center or in specific parts of this new commercial sector that we're seeing that's kind of burgeoning in Texas. We really need that talent. So both young and old, I think, are really going to benefit uh, from uh, learning about space and uh, becoming part of the, the future in this facility. Um, thank you, Dr. Ambrose. Well, we've got you up here. Uh, thank you. Can you sort of, do you have any projections on like, you know, how many students or, uh, will be coming out of this facility? Yes. So to be very clear, this is not a degree granting, you know, instant, you know, we've, we've got plenty of degrees coming out of a and We have 75? Oh, one more than that. 175. But yeah, around the state. So, um, we're, we're producing a lot of degrees. So this is a unique facility where we're gonna be able to do research. Uh, I would expect a lot of grad students to be going there to, to work on, on research. And we're also taking a very inclusive uh, uh, approach. In addition to the 150 industry that the chancellor mentioned came together thinking about, we had 103 faculty from around the state come to College Station for another workshop on how professors could use this facility. So uh, we had people from every part of the state, El Paso, North Texas, the Valley, uh, all come together brainstorming on how they would use this facility for their students and in their research and senior design projects. Uh, it could be a very dynamic place where all Texans get to come together and, and, and work on the moon and Mars. You know, what a great opportunity.